So now that we've finished covering two of the supergroups associated with the domain Eukarya, those were Excavata and the Sarclade, both of which consisted entirely of Protus, thus they are found in this Protus lecture. We're going to move forward. We're going to now do the next supergroup, as we alluded to in the previous video, and this next supergroup is of great importance to you in Bio 116, and generally in your life as well, because it actually what gave, is what gave rise to the land plants. And we know just how important land plants are. We're going to be studying them in great detail in Bio 116 a little bit later. But right now, we'll just look at the protus side of the RK plastida. So let's entitle this next flowchart, RK plastida. Something that should already be understood is that they definitely have plastids, right? So thus the name, RK plastida. The good thing about the RK plastida group that I want you to remember is that, and write this uh, right on the top somewhere, is that this is actually a monophyletic group. And that is a rarity. That is a rarity in the study of protus. Protus are so polyphyletic. It's so difficult figuring out what the common ancestor is. Is it with a common ancestor with the other thing? Uh, how can we group this correctly in terms of the evolutionary history, the phylogeny? From RK plus data, they are monophyletic. If you look at figure 28.2, a figure that I mentioned before, something that I suggest constantly going back every time we cover a protist, every time we cover a type of protist, look at figure 28.2, you will see that in figure 28.2, RK plastida have a true common ancestor. That's a rarity in the protist study of, of life, let's say, because this true common ancestor is defined by the fact that um, it doesn't have, uh, there aren't any dotted lines. And you'll see what I mean by that when you look at the figure. Dotted lines means we don't really know if the, what the common ancestor is. RK plastida, all the way to the very beginning, the very first common ancestor, has no dotted lines. Um, so it's a very strong monophyletic group, good for phylogenous study. So now, in terms of what do we need to know uh, when we're looking at protists, we need to look at red and green algae, something that we've covered actually when we talked about primary endosymbiosis, a little bit in secondary. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail, just like I promised earlier in the videos. So first one to cover is the red algae. Like I said, algae are often uh, wrongly characterized as plants when instead they are supposed to mostly be for the, uh, for, you know, the great most part, they are protists and red algae are no exception to that. Red algae are, like most protists, photosynthetic. And because they're photosynthetic, they actually have something known as a phyco, uh, a physothrin pigment. Uh, I hope I pronounced that somewhat correctly. And let me at least spell it correctly. So we have P-H-Y-C-O-E-R-C-O-E-R-T-H-I-N. Uh, I think it's physothrin uh, pigment. Now, what the heck does that mean? Uh, this type of pigment, uh, plus other pigments at least, uh, we got to make sure we mention the other pigments as well, of course. Um, this is a characteristic pigment because this is actually going to give off a black color. And that's very, very unique in our study of photosynthesis, of accessory pigments. This black color is very interesting because black can be absorbed. And when would black be best absorbed for something like a red algae? The reason why that they are so unique is because their photosynthesis is functional since they can live very deep in water. They can live very deep in water. Why is that? That's because they have a pigment that can absorb black. And if they can absorb black, they can absorb the ever slightest rays of light and really exemplify and really uh, accentuate the slightest slivers of light because of all this other pigment that they can absorb as well, especially the black pigment that can, they can absorb. Thus, photosynthesis can work very, very strongly. Now, red algae are also mostly unicellular. Again, mostly. Uh, we always have to say that when we're studying protists. Mostly unicellular in their structure. Um, and there are over 6,000, about 6,000 species of these guys, just the red algae. Great amount of diversity. You know what that tells you? That means red algae are probably pretty good at what they do. They live very deep, not many competitors there. They're able to still do photosynthesis in a very deep water. Thus, they've evolved over 6,000 different species with this unicellular structure. Um, their overall habitat We've uh, mentioned it very briefly in terms of where they live, in terms of how deep, but they usually like to live in warm, more tropical ocean waters. Tropical ocean. 
um, and they can uh, also usually are found attached to rocks. Attached to rocks, and because they're attached to rocks, that gives them a nice safe home, let's say. Most people, most animals don't want to go towards rocks. They don't provide any energy, they don't provide anything. But for these red algae, um, they actually do provide a nice habitat. Final fun fact about red algae, something I would probably remember, is that uh, a type of red algae is the porphyra. And porphyra, some people might know what this is, is actually uh, what people use for sushi wraps. Sushi wraps, otherwise known as uh, nori, I think in Japanese, this is the actual wrap that sushi is put within, um, and that is a red algae. So fun fact for you to remember about red algae, very easy to remember that um, since it's uh, relevant to us as humans. So nori, which is a thing that wraps sushi, otherwise known as periphera, is a red algae, which is part of the Archaeplastida supergroup of eukaryotes, which is uh, mostly protus. And uh, you'll see what I mean by mostly protus in just a second. Finally, uh, we have green algae. Green algae, critical, critical, critical in the eventual evolution of land plants. Very related to land plants. Um, and that's exactly what I'm going to write first. Closely, closely related to land plants. Remember, land plants are critical for everything uh, on planet Earth because of their oxygen capability, their capabilities in terms of what they do with CO2 and oxygen. And thus, anything that results in land plants must have played an incredibly important role in the evolution of all other things after land plants. Um, and the reason why they're closely related is because of uh, really a complex genomic studies that reveal that they have similar chloroplasts. And chloroplasts themselves, if you remember, they have their own DNA within them. They have their own genes. And if you uh, look at the genes of the chloroplasts within green algae and the genes of the chloroplasts within land plants, the genes really match up pretty closely. And that's doing it very simplified in terms of what I just said. But it's a complex way to understand um, a very important relationship between the green algae and the land plants, looking at their genes within the chloroplasts. Um, in addition, there are two types of green algae to remember. Uh, the two types of green algae are the chlorophytes. So chloro, clearly, definitely going to be using chloroplast. Uh, chlorophytes are mostly in fresh water. That's their habitat, so we'll write that down. Mostly fresh water, not the ocean. Um, and a good example of this, something to remember, of course, examples, always remember these. This is a, a, a chlorodomonas. Let me uh, spell this correctly. A... Actually, no, it's called a uh, Clomendomenes. I don't even know what that is, uh, but this is the general spelling, at least, of it, at least from my notes. Uh, what is this? This is a typical green algae. That's all I have there, so that's all you need to know. Typical green algae. Typical green algae, um, just remember the name, I guess. And that's our chlorophytes. Uh, and the one that uh, is uh, something that we'll see a lot a little bit later in Bio 2 is carophytes. Um, this will be seen a lot in later lectures, so keep that in mind. Keep that in the back of your head. Carophytes are the most closely related algae to plants. So we'll write that down as most, most closely related algae to land plants, carophytes versus the chlorophytes. Um, so that's our green algae story. The summary of the green algae, they're closely related to land plants. Um, and the other type of archaeplastida to remember um, are land plants. But what I'm going to say about the land plants, and I'm actually going to put these in parentheses, is because these are, hopefully you can deduce this on your own, but these are not protists. So these two are a type of protist. These are not protists, but they these two are closely related, green algae more so, to the land plants than anything else, and thus they gave rise to the land plants. Thus we have this monophyletic group. Look at figure 28.2, highly suggested to really drive home the point of the archaeplastid monophyletic nature. These are some characteristics to remember of the two protist types, and then the land plants, they're not protist. They're their own thing. They're their own, uh, we'll talk about them a little bit later, their own type of structure in terms of classification of organisms. So that's Archaeplastida.